is basically telling all these pharmaceutical executives, hey, look at what I got here. I got this peptide that actually has these great effects in diabetic mice for an extended period of time. You should license this. And most of them said, no, what are you talking about? It's a lizard venom. I'm not gonna inject that in humans. That sounds crazy. I'm Mary Long, and that's Wall Street Journal reporter, Rolf Winkler, co-author of a story titled, Monster Diet Drugs Like Ozempic Started with Actual Monsters. The market possibility for these monster treatments have caught investors' attention. It's one reason why the drug makers working on these products, like Eli Lilly and Novo Nordisk, have outpaced the market's return by 20 percentage points over the past 12 months. But overnight sensations can take decades to create. And these blockbuster treatments trace back to previously obscure research on deep sea fish and venomous lizards. Ricky Mulvey caught up with Winkler to discuss the science behind weight loss drugs, what the early research reveals about today's side effects, and what it's like to be bitten by a Gila monster. Weight loss drugs, including Ozempic and Wagovi, started with anglerfish and possibly venomous lizards. Rolf, I really enjoyed the story you wrote with Ben Cohen, and it, it enlightened me about the, the very strange and long path that these drug, drugs take. It was a fun one to write. Yeah, they, uh, they have a sort of interesting history. You'd, you'd think that as fast as Ozempic has sort of captured the zeitgeist in the past, I don't know, eight, nine months, you think they kind of came out of nowhere, but this class of drugs actually, the first one was approved in 2005, and their development science behind them dates back to 1980. Yeah, it starts possibly with the angler fish, right? These these bottom feeding fish that are known for their uh, luminescent fin rays, which attract little tiny fish, which they then eat, but they also are able to create this this hormone that shows up in the weight loss drugs today. Can you describe how that works a little bit? Well, yeah, the 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 connection there, angler fish are these ugly disgusting fish that have incredibly sharp teeth, you know, these carnivorous bottom feeders. The connection there is really you may have heard of these drugs uh, sometimes referred to as GLP-1 receptor agonists. Basically, they mimic a hormone in the human body called GLP-1. Ozempic and Wagovi do. Uh, Munjaro, the other big drug, it, it mimics two hormones, but GLP-1 is sort of a star player here. And the anglerfish is central because it was it was in research on anglerfish dating back to 1980 that helped us identify this hormone. It was first identified in the anglerfish and then later in humans. And it was then, you know, they discovered that this hormone actually has what they call insulinotropic effects, which means it stimulates insulin release in the body. And the reason if they, they, if you want me to get into it, the reason they went with anglerfish, also a fun part of the story, back in 1980, there was this new technology called recombinant DNA. It really launched the biotechnology revolution. It helped us create the first human synthesized human insulin, for instance, basically it's, it's a, it's a, I'm going to butcher this, but it's kind of a, a cloning tool, a uh, really brilliant invention back in the seventies, but people were afraid of it as they are of many new technologies like AI. They thought that the, what they, what they do in recombinant DNA is they take bacteria often and they, they'll, they'll splice different kinds of DNA together and then put it into bacteria that, that will then propagate that DNA. People worried, wait, what if this gets in the water supply? And so there were restrictions in Massachusetts where these researchers were working. You couldn't do this work on mammals. And so they decided, well, could we do it in cold-blooded animals? And they said, yeah. And they, they, got it, they were able to do that. So they went fishing for anglerfish. They hired a guy to go catch this stuff, throw it on the dock. And it ended up being lucky because the anglerfish actually have a special organ that produces the hormones they wanted to study, which made it easy for them to get samples of pure tissue. So... Anyway, it's kind of that was that was really the science that led to the discovery of GLP one, which is the, the all important hormone that we're mimicking inside today's drugs. And today's drugs sort of have somewhat solved a similar problem that the GLP one presents, which is that it vanishes from the body quickly and it makes people nauseous. But one of the ways they were able to delay it vanishing comes from scientists studying animal venoms. So having discovered this human hormone called GLP-1, that was, you know, early 80s. 
fast forward to 1986, 1987, they discovered what it did, that it had these effects, it stimulated insulin release. But they also discovered that it disappears, it gets chewed up by enzymes in the body in minutes and gets washed away by the kidneys. So you can't really just inject GLP-1 into humans and hope it'll be a good drug because it's just gone really instantly. To test it, just to see if it had these effects, you know, they were looking at it with, with you know, insulin stimulation, they're thinking, well, maybe this is good for diabetes. They had to infuse people with an IV, like a constant drip, which is not anybody's idea of a marketable pharmaceutical walking around with an IV pole, right? But they wanted to study it to find it had these effects. And sure enough, when they when you're mainlining it, if you turn up the dose, it just made people puke, which foreshadows today's today's side effects from these drugs. The next interesting sort of sort of uh, kind of side road in this whole story was was another animal, Gila monsters. They're native to the American Southwest. They actually make a hormone inside their body that is similar to GLP-1. It's 50% it, the, the amino acids, uh, the amino acid kind of structure of this hormone inside the Gila monster is 50% homologous is the word to human GLP-1. And the person who discovered this was a, was a scientist at the Bronx Veterans Administration of all places who happened to be an expert in identifying peptides. And he'd met a guy who'd done Gila monster work dating back to 1980. And they proposed a collaboration. They identified this hormone. They put it into mice. And they learned that, wait a minute, it actually helps the mice control their diabetes. And crucially, it does it for 24 hours. I don't remember if it was exactly 24, but it was for many hours. And so that Bronx Veterans Administration researcher, his name was John Eng, he thought, hmm, this is interesting. I'm going to patent this. And then I'm going to try and sell it to pharmaceutical companies. And that is a long multi-year process. And it was expensive. And he's on the road postering at conferences. That's They call it postering because you do some scientific research and the people who are throwing the conference, they're not going to let you give a talk on your research. What they'll do is they'll let you put up a poster in a conference hall and stand next to it. Uh, it's got to be, a you know, for him, nobody wanted to talk to him. It had to have been a pride swallowing experience a little bit. Because here he is with this poster of this work he's done with Gila monster venom. It was a derivative of, of basically their venom that that where they found this peptide. He's basically telling all these pharmaceutical executives, hey, look at what I got here. I got this peptide that actually has these great effects in diabetic mice for an extended period of time. You should license this. And most of them said, no, what are you talking about? It's a lizard venom. I'm not going to inject that in humans. That sounds crazy. But one pharmaceutical executive at one of these conferences looks at his poster and says, huh, that's interesting. Maybe this is the key to turning this GLP-1 stuff into a drug. And so he licensed it. And then the real hard work begins. And, you know, and then it's a, really, it was a nine-year process of developing it, clinical trials. And in 2005, you get a drug called Bieta. The generic term is called Ixenotide. That was the first GLP-1 receptor agonist that came out. And it was, der it was derived from the Gila monster venom. And it's sort of interesting to today's, the story of today's drugs, uh, not because they're derived from Gila monster venom. Those guys, the, the, the Novo Nordisk and Eli Lilly solved the problem in different ways. But what some of those folks will tell you in this world is that, look, that drug demonstrated that this could be done, that you actually could come up with a GLP-1 mimicking drug that lasted in the body for you know, a, reason, an, an, a sufficient period of time that it could be sold as a drug. And so they, you know, then you get the pharmaceutical companies kicking it into high gear, the research and development budgets. And sure enough, you get the drugs we have today, which are leading to phenomenal, phenomenal weight loss. So we'll give the anglerfish 100% credit in developing, in developing these drugs and perhaps the Gila monster partial credit because it's... Yeah. They're not injecting the specific, the venom is not a part of the current drugs that are being made today. Correct. They actually, so Xenotide, when it came out, was, and, and by the way, all of these drugs really started as, as treatments for diabetics. That's what that started as. It had positive effects for diabetics, but you had to inject it twice a day. So it's better than an IV infusion, 
but it's still not. And by the way, the needle they were using for the injection was, it was this, the gauge of the needle was, was larger. It was not super comfortable. If you've used Ozempic and, and Wagovia or Manjaro, today's drugs, I haven't, but people who tell me it's, it's basically a painless needle, tiny, tiny little thing. But so, but that drug, bigger needle twice a day, not, you're not going to get a, and, and by the way, you didn't get any kind of blockbuster weight loss out of it. So it wasn't itself going to be a blockbuster drug. But then Novo Nordisk comes out with its drug called liraglutide. Well, you know it as Victoza. That was a bigger drug. It was a once daily injection, also a smaller needle and better effects. And by the way, they showed that it had benefits, cardiovascular benefits. So one of the things that diabetics really um, suffer from is, is basically cardiovascular trouble, heart trouble. And this drug they demonstrated had benefit. It, it, it was it protected the heart as well as helping control the diabetes. But it's since then it's just been a steady advance. After that, the, the next drug from there was Trulicity from Eli Lilly, which had similar a similar impact as liraglutide and controlling things. But it was a once weekly injection. Then you have Novo Nordisk comes out comes back with Ozempic, approved in 2017, another once weekly which has even more benefits. And what they discovered was this incredible weight loss of an average of 15% over a period of a, just over a year uh, on people who were using the drug, which is now you're starting to talk real numbers. When you have somebody who's obese, 15% of their body weight can be a large, large number. And it's just, and, and there's more coming behind it that have, that show, you know, the data is even better. Promise only one more Gila Monster question, but this is a burning question I've had since reading your article. You feature a dentist, Mark Seward, because when you're studying Gila Monsters, you got to find him. He is a dentist in Colorado Springs, and this guy has 100 Gila Monsters in his basement. Did you find out why he has so many of these very specific lizards? Mark Seward has today, that this is, by the way, when he, when he is part of that story, that was around 2000. And they were developing the drug. And really, you know what? They don't need to find Gila monsters because you can find there, there, you can get powdered venom to study. And you go to places like Miami Serpentarium, which that's that's its own interesting story, <laughs> where the guy who ran that probably handled millions of snakes in his life and survived 170 poisonous snake bites. That's where they got it. But during the course of studying it, the small company that had licensed this Gila monster venom did this compound to turn it into a drug. They just wanted to know more about how, what, what does this thing even do in the Gila monsters, this, this compound? We need to study it. So how do you do that? They find this guy, he was a dentist in Colorado whose hobby was raising Gila monsters in his basement. And he had at the time over a hundred, he told me. Now he's got you know probably over 60. He still does this. Um, he's retired from dentistry. And it's actually not very hard to keep these, these the Gila monsters because really, they live most of their life below ground. They come out, they eat a few meals a year, uh, and then they store the fat in their tails and slowly digest it. So it's not too hard to basically keep a bunch in your basement because that's not unlike how they live in the wild. Anyway, so he, <laughs> some small pharmaceutical company finds this guy who has a bunch of Gila monsters in his basement. They say, we, we want to find out what, what this hormone is doing inside the Gila monster. So we need you to do blood tests on the Gila monster. And so... He's got them. He's he had to you know feed them and then take blood you know and stick a needle in their tail and take out blood samples at at specific intervals and you know he told me that in all of his all of his years raising Gila monsters he really does Gila monster husbandry he's really kind of just breeding them they're an endangered species and and he's breeding them so he's adding to the population call him the call him the Elon Musk of of the Gila monster class right so he had this restraint where he said in all these years. The, the, the only time he's ever been bitten by a Gila monster was when he was doing these experiments, right? He's got one of the Gila monsters in one of its into the, one of these restraints he's he's built, and you know he's sticking the needle in the tail, and one of the Gila monsters said, you know, <laughs> you and and slipped its restraint, turned around and snapped and just snapped onto his palm, and he said it's like a wasp sting, but a lot worse. <laughs> Did you go to the hospital? He said no, I had to keep doing more. <laughs> more, more blood draws on, and 15 minutes. So I walked over to the sink and I washed it out a lot. He didn't call. He didn't call a sick day after getting bitten by a Gila monster. You know, I feel better. I feel better knowing there's a conservation angle to this, and, and that he's not just keeping dozens, if not a hundred, 
Gila monsters in his basement. He doesn't go catch them and, and from the wild and bring them, as far as I know, he doesn't go catch them and bring them into his house. Good. He's, <laughs> he's breeding them. Jumping to today, one of the incredible things about this drug is that like Ozempic may not just help with weight loss, but it might help with alcoholism and drug addictions because it, it apparently it reduces like the brain's reward system to dopamine. Are we seeing any of the, the side effect issues from the early research? Are there any clues from the early research on these weight loss drugs that, were, that are showing up today in the side effect issues besides the nausea and the vomiting? Really bad. I mean, the, the early research... There's, well, there's a whole bunch of stuff there, depending on how much time you got. The fun, another fun element of the story is when they were first studying GLP-1 and they were doing these IV studies where they're infusing people with various doses, there were at least two different studies where I spoke to people and they said when they turned up the dose, people just vomited. They got sick. And, and then they learned the, the way to take these drugs is to titrate them up. You start at a low dose and your system build builds a tolerance and you work up to the therapeutic dose. So that was certainly foreshadowed. There were there was a scare related to these drugs circa 2009, 2010, when a couple of doctors came out really hard arguing that they caused pancreatitis. And that was something that for a time threatened the drug class. There was there, there, there was pressure on the FDA to pull it, to, to pull the drugs. The FDA not only didn't pull the drugs, they in effect rescued them because there was a paper in the New England Journal, Journal of Medicine, I think this is 2015, it was 2014 or 2015, that basically said these fears about pancreatitis, we don't see it in the data. It's not, it's not there, uh, according to the FDA. So that put out the fire, as it were. But that was, there. you know, when it comes to side effects, I think there's, on the one hand... You know, in terms of long-term treatment, on the one hand, this drug class has been around. Remember, since two thousand five, since that first drug, the Gila Monster drug, that one came out in two thousand five. So you do have some long-term data on the use of these medications. At the same time, Ozempic and Wagovi and Munjaro are being used by a population of people that is so much larger than any of the other prior drugs that there, I think scientists are on guard for, you know, are there going to be other things that pop up? Recently, the European Medical Association, God, is that what the, it's EMA, I, I forget what the acronym actually stands for, but their, their FDA has had reports of people who are having suicidal ideation, depression come in from, that they say come from these drugs. So they're investigating that. They're investigating those reports. I think that's something you'll see whenever you put a drug into this, into so many people, you may end up seeing effects that you didn't encounter during the clinical trials. So you have a larger sample base. Much the the, the N is is an order an orders of magnitude larger. You know, you've got you've got a, we're talking instead of a few thousands of people that are testing these things, we're talking millions. And you know, people are saying that there could be tens of millions of people. If, if the price comes down, there's hundreds of millions of people worldwide with obesity, never mind type 2 diabetes. So this is going to be applicable to a very, very wide population of people. And the drug companies are counting on that. It'll be interesting to see how this story continues to develop. The story is called Monster Diet Drugs Like Ozempic Started with Actual Monsters. It's in the Wall Street Journal. Rolf, that was one of my it was one of my favorite business stories I've read in a while. I appreciate your work on it and appreciate your time on Motley Full Money. Thanks, Ricky. Yeah, happy to happy to be here. As always, people on the program may have interests in the stocks they talk about, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against. So don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear. I'm Mary Long. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.